Okay, uh, we'll start. Um, I'm actually the, the chair for this sec session and I'm actually introducing uh, the first part of the session as well. I'm the first speaker. And I'm the first speaker of five. So we're cramming a lot of information into this. And we've got some big news. Thanks very much to the uh, sponsor for this, uh, for Bibba. Um, I've known about their work for a long time and they do some, it's really good to, that they're still going 40 years on plus. Um, right, brief introduction about the speaker. Well, it's me, Stephen Martin. Uh, I've been in this game 40 years. Um, I've retired, but an Emirates professor, so I retired to do research. And the research I've been busy doing for the last three months, I will now uh, give to you. Okay, so today's talk, so this is me starting the talk, is about varroa resistance uh, in the UK and elsewhere. And our presenters today are myself, um, Clive, Rona, Joe and Steve and the work's been funded by beekeepers, by you, uh, BDI, via BDI and BBKA. So I've travelled widely, well, I've visited many resistant colonies around the world, including uh, England, and we have a really good idea of how the mechanism works. I'm just going to explain again uh, about the mechanism. And those of you that this is, you've not, this is the first time you've heard it, don't worry. There is a resource we're going to give you in the next slide. So in resistant colonies, they have learnt to investigate cells. So it, this is a hygienic behaviour, but this is specific for varroa-infested varro cells. And they've learnt to detect the unique compounds that come from the infested cell, and they only come from varroa infested cells. There are four ketones and two acetates the French teams took six years to work out. These are unique to honeybees, so honeybees, honeybees don't produce it, it's just the mite offspring produce them. So eventually, specialist bees learn to associate that smell with an infested cell, and then they open up that cell, make it, uh, check that it's okay. They also open up other cells nearby because the surface of the comb is actually very busy, lots of air currents moving around, so they tend to open lots of cells in that area. And then they move on to look for other infested cells. Now, these open cells, which you may have seen, we call ball brood, um, can happen, these uncapped cells, there's two things that can happen. And there's two other groups of bees in your colony. There are thing, bees called recapper bees. And they walk up to the cell and they go, hey, why is this cell open? They check the pupae, the pupae's alive. Ah, oh, well and they recap it over. And uh, it even can have a mite in, and they recap it over. But there's another group of bees, a remover bees. And if they find these cells first, then they will check that the chemicals are there, and then they will enlarge the, uh, the, the hole and basically start to uh, chew them down uh, not just that bee, but loads of bees. One, one bee starts, the rest of them uh, follow, and basically, in a way, remove it and remove all the offspring. Uh, the mite, the mother mite escapes, and when she escapes, she's uh, able to infest another cell. But mites only are able to reproduce two or three times in their life. So if they keep getting interrupted, it really reduces the mite load. And this is exactly what happens. This recapping and removal is continuous. It, it goes on many times during the brood development. Ralph Bootler was filming it, 
and he saw one cell being opened and closed 17 times during the developmental period. Normal bees appear at the end, but eventually these, these ones will get removed. Um, you get increased infertile mites in resistant colonies. This has been known for decades. Uh, even I was measuring this in Mexico. Um, and this reduces your mite loads because these can't reproduce. And so you end up uh, a decrease in the mite load, a de an in decrease in the viral load as well, because there's not as many transmitters, and the bees are happy, and this is how resistant colonies work. So I, I think now we're pushing at an open door. There are a lot of people uh, in this country. We've estimated 8% of the UK beekeepers which is about 2,000 in numerical terms, I have not treated for six years and beyond. So this is something that's actually going, and, and eventually now the science can catch up and explain why they're able to do this. So what I've been doing over the last, or oh, me and uh, the rest of the speakers, I've been doing over the last three months, at the uh, request of beekeepers, we've done... Uh, announced today, it goes live today, it is live, we've just uh, released it. There is a website, varroaresistant.uk, uh, and we've tested it, should be all singing, all dancing, all links should work. Uh, don't look at it now, because you'll, you'll end up watching that than the actual video. There's plenty of time after it. Um, it has uh, general information about key traits that are involved. It's got all the scientific evidence that explains varroa resistance for, your, for the bookworms here. Uh, for what will be most interesting for most of the beekeepers is the advice page, uh, links and examples of how to stop um, mite treatments and how to actually get to a state of resistance. And we've got some uh, commonly uh, answered questions, uh, we have a new site, and we've we don't have a, a, a mail, so you can't contact us via the website. You can get us via other means. It's just, that's just to save my sanity of having thousands of <laughs> beekeepers saying, this is rubbish. <laughs> <laughs> and this is the Flavicon, uh, which is the little thing that will be left on your um, mobile phone. Unfortunately, it's so small you can't see, but if you look at it there, you yeah, get the impression. Okay, and that's me done. So I'm now going to hand over to four beekeepers. Um, they have been not treating for many, many years. They're highly experienced and respected beekeepers, and they're going to tell you your personal journeys about uh, treatment-free beekeeping. Please, Clive. Uh, <clears throat> thanks very much, uh, Stephen, for what you've done. And uh, thank you for getting us here. Uh, time is limited, so uh, excuse me uh, using notes. 14 years. It's a long time. 14 years without using any treatments for varroa. In fact, this uh, is our, our 15th year. Uh, Sean and I do our beekeeping together, and uh, this is our story of discovering naturally varroa-resistant honeybees and becoming treatment-free beekeepers. Uh, Sean's nearby, and she may or may not take over if I, uh, if I fall over. <laughs> This is a summary of our history. 13 years, 85, 98, traditional beekeeping, no varroa. 1998, later in the year, August, we found our first varroa and uh, we complied. We treated with Baverol. 2006 was our last treatment with Baverol. We were told by the NBU inspector that uh, the 
resistance to that chemical was increasing. 2007, early in the year, in the spring, we treated with thymol in cooking oil, uh, supplied on tissue. These were the day, early days people were experimenting, Vroa. Uh, 2008, the following year in January, we had used oxalic acid once, five mil per seam of bees, and uh, then we used some thymol crystals, and that was just two teaspoons of thymol crystals on a strip of um, uh, material across the top of brood combs. 2009, early in that year, March, was our last treatment with thymol or any other treatment on some of our hives. 2009 to 2023, right up until today, and uh, our bees have overwintered well. We've still got plenty of bees and they're doing well. 2009 until now, traditional beekeeping exactly as we did before Varroa, with our bees coexisting with Varroa mites. So, why did we stop treating? Could summarise it three main reasons. Firstly, we used chemicals but had concerns about those. Secondly, observations that the presence of varroa mites and varroa damaged bees was decreasing in our hives season on season. And this was particularly on our minds in 2009 when we treated some hives with those thymol crystals on a strip of material and not others. And we really could see no obvious differences in the colonies as the season unfolded. Thirdly, realizing local, wild, we're very happy to call them wild, feral colonies had not died out in our area. This applied to the visual examination of colonies taken from fallen trees and out of buildings. And these revealed healthy bees and brood with no obvious damage from Varroa. And this to us was powerful evidence. Two more examples. The first in 2011 was early in our treatment-free experiment when some experts were telling us that the viral load would build up in our bees and they would not last beyond three years. This was a, a commonly expressed opinion, early days of Varroa. This on the screen, this was a big colony filling five, two five-gallon containers and sad that it had to be removed. The second was found after a, a summer storm felled a huge 80-foot oak tree leaning away from you in the, in the photograph there. The nest was scattered and torrential rain killed most of the bees. The, this colony in 2015 and 17 years after Varroa arrived in our area showed evidence of being established for a long time. In particular, the layered debris you can see there beneath the colony was a foot in depth, my hive tool there is about a foot long, indicating accumulation over many years. So it was a clear conclusion to ourselves that colonies were surviving without treatment. Uh, who remembers CCD? Colony Collapse Disorder. Back in 2010, 2012, this catchy acronym was in the media, along with dire warnings of a possible catastrophe with honeybees. Along with many beekeepers, Sean and I were concerned. And for five years, we carried out winter losses surveys of local beekeepers to try and find out what was going on, what was happening. And to our surprise, we found that in our area, many beekeepers were already experimenting with non-treatment. My time is limited, but if I can just refer you to the bottom line of the table. I could chat about this for a long time, but just the bottom line of the table. And over the five years, we collected data on 1,573 colonies 
where the winter losses averaged 19% for treated colonies and 13% for untreated. 19% for treated colonies, 13% for untreated colonies. Now, we personally interviewed beekeepers for those surveys. They were our fellow beekeepers and our friends, and uh, here they are. I'm going to show you some of them. There's only 25 of them here. This is the importance of your fellow beekeepers. Uh, if we got time and energy, I could have another 100 standing behind me. So we were very, very lucky, I think, with uh, the beekeepers that we'd got in our area. Just a meeting of our beekeeping association. In 2019, we plotted the treatment-free beekeepers that we knew geographically and got this distribution. The number of beekeepers not treating is now greater. In 2019, for example, our beekeeping association was 40 plus members. It is now 80 plus. Your association members are very important on the journey to finding varroa resistant bees. Our Seen and Avionith Beekeeping Association is relatively informal and members stop treating their bees in their own time and in their own way particularly after seeing this approach working with other members. There are understandable concerns over losing colonies, and this may happen. We may have been lucky and have not experienced high losses. On the screen, this is a summary of our winter losses over many years. We started with one colony, colony numbers are shown in blue, and we now overwinter about 20. The graph conveniently divides into three blocks before we had Varroa, treating with Varroa, and not treating with Varroa. Now, except for one year when we lost hives to mice, could point that out. That's somewhere over here. We had a particular loss, losses shown in red. But excepting for that year, our losses pre varroa and now are about the same. It's the first and the last, those two graphs. We like honey, and our harvest over the last 10 years has an average of £36.3 per overwintered colony. That is an accurate figure. I'm lucky I've got Sean, who's very good with collecting the data. And if it seems a tad small, I can add that over the same 10 years, we made 96 starter colonies for new beekeepers. It's our website where we've got further information. Thank you and good luck on your own journey to finding varroa resistant bees. Thank you, Clive. Um, so I'm also a treatment-free beekeeper um, of uh, a number of years. Uh, I am based in Worcestershire, for those of you that aren't aware where Worcestershire is, because obviously I don't sound as though I'm from Worcestershire. Um, it's about an hour and a half's drive south of here, and it's a county that has a lot of beekeepers. We're in a, a densely uh, populated county in terms of hives, um, but quite a rural county as well. So we started beekeeping, my husband Richard and I, in 2000, and it was very conventional. We went on a beginner's course, we followed the instructions that we were given to treat, so we put strips in, um, but it was something that I was never particularly comfortable with. Um, so. After a few years, we also started to notice that there were feral colonies surviving without any beekeepers obviously intervening. And I began to wonder whether 
that situation could, you know, be of use to our bees. We were collecting swarms, that's one of the swarms from, I think that's last year, from a long-lived colony in a building at a site where I worked at that time. So we knew that the colonies were long-lived and they tended to produce a swarm each year. We were often called to collect the swarms. So those bees were part of our um, apiary. Um, I was also fortunate enough to listen to a talk by Ron Hoskins of the Swindon Bee Group, who I'm sure many of you will know, about his work on being treatment-free and developing varroa-resistant bees. And that sort of clinched it. Um, so in 2007, we decided that that would be our last year of, or our first year of being um, without varroacides. We certainly weren't treatment-free at that stage. We weren't using chemical varroacides, but we opted to go for sort of biotechnical controls. So we started out and we did a lot of monitoring and we used the NBU graph on varroa and we monitored our bees about three or four times a year, um, every colony. We didn't have huge numbers of colonies at that stage. Uh, we also used the icing sugar dusting during the early part of the season. Um, and with the sort of results from the monitoring, if colonies had high mite levels, we would often shook swarm or cull drones. So all of our colonies raised drones, they were given drone foundation. Um, and if they had high mite numbers, the drones were culled. But in colonies where the mite numbers were low, we would deliberately raise queens, we would do splits, and we would also allow them to raise those drones. So gradually, we influenced our population. We also continued to collect swarms uh, at that stage. So our numbers grew. And in general, our losses were low or average for the area. We're part of the local beekeeping association, so we're aware of what others were experiencing in the area. And we didn't experience anything particularly different. But obviously, we were still controlling Varroa in the colonies that um, were not showing you know, particularly low mite levels. So that continued for a while. Um, and we did see big differences. So some colonies, the mite levels were really low. Others, they were really high. Um, we also saw lots of immature mites, which we weren't really sure what that actually meant, but we saw a lot on the inspection boards. And bald brood. So Stephen has mentioned the significance of bald brood. We didn't know the significance of bald brood. And uh, other beekeepers and uh, experts, as a lot still do, say, you know, it's a genetic problem. You want to requeen those colonies. Uh, we didn't follow that advice. And thankfully, we didn't follow that advice. Um, we also saw uh, bees removing dead pupa. So we were seeing it, but not necessarily putting two and two together as to what was uh, happening. So time has gone on, um, and a number of colonies have increased, a number of apiaries have increased. Um, and with that, we have reduced our mite monitoring to virtually nothing now. Um, we probably should do some, but it's just become a, a bit of a low priority. Um, we still raise our own stock. We don't buy in stock. Our queens, our bees are all our own. Um, and so we raise queens basically from our best colonies. So we're still assessing the colonies, but not um, particularly looking at mite numbers. And um, with that, we've deliberately maintained diversity within our population. So we've never raised large numbers of queens from just one colony. We've tried to sort of raise queens and splits, etc., from a range of our base colonies. Um, and so our population is still uh, very diverse. Um, we are very conventional beekeepers in every respect, apart from the varroa management. So we do mark and clip queens. We do manage swarming, um, we do feed, um, and you know, we don't do routine queen replacement, but you, know, you would recognise our beekeeping as conventional beekeeping. We're in national hives, 
we're not doing anything out of the ordinary, really. Um, our winter losses do vary. Uh, again, they're, they're typical for the area and the year, so we have good years and bad years, like all beekeepers do. These are uh, a few of our sort of recent figures, so um, you know they're they're in line with you know what others have been sort of experiencing. What do we see in our colonies? Well, most of the time, nothing out of the ordinary. The brood looks like you know brood in most of your colonies. What we do sort of see every so often, and when you start looking, you see it more often is the bulb brood that Stephen mentioned. So here you can see the um, uncapped cells. You can see the, the bees looking out at you. Um, they're still alive, they are, uh, and they will probably go on to emerge as perfectly healthy bees, except for the one that's up here. Um, that's definitely not going to uh, emerge as a healthy bee. It's a, it's a pupa that is being chewed out, so there's a bit of cannibalism going on, and that's a sign that there were probably mites in there, the uh, bees were not happy with it, and they're dealing with it. Um, the rest of these will probably be recapped. Um, a lot of the time, the pictures of bald brood you see, they've got pink or purple eyes. Here, it's at a slightly earlier stage, so you can see it at different stages. Um, in different colonies. Our bees themselves, they're Worcestershire mongrels, they're nothing that um, any particular type of breed of bee. They vary in all sorts of respects. Some are very dark, some are um, much lighter, some are more prolific, some are thriftier, um, some uh, overwinter better than others. They, they're very diverse. The only thing that they've all got in common is they're high or very high recappers. And we know that thanks to work from Stephen and his team um, of researchers who've um, investigated that for us. So finally, a few suggestions for those that are uh, potentially interested in going treatment free. Monitor your varroa. I'm not doing it now, but I did it initially and it is important because you will see big differences between uh, colonies. Look at your frames of brood. It's easy to miss small patches of bald brood, but once you get your eye in, you may well start to see it uh, more often, and the cannibalism. If you've got a diverse population, then there's a chance that they're not all going to be the same. Some will be better than others, and so those ones that aren't managing their varroa particularly well, do something about them. Manage the varroa, requeen them, rehome them. Don't do, as we did um, initially, hang on to them, because they are a source of uh, varroa that are going to infest the colonies that are actually coping. So you don't want that sort of source of varroa if your other colonies are doing well. So um, you have to uh, follow my advice and not what I've actually done. Um, we didn't get rid of them, and that's probably the one thing that I would change if I went back and did it again. And finally, make increase from those that are doing really well. You know, the ones that are coping, raise queens, do splits, and raise drones. And if you've got others around that are interested in being treatment free, then sell or give away or, you know, spread those good genetics about, because it's much easier if there's more than just yourself uh, doing that. Thank you. Hi, I'm Joe Ibbotson. I'm a non-treatment beekeeper in Northamptonshire. So I've been non-treatment from the very onset of beekeeping. I have never treated my colonies and I inherited my mentors' colonies that were also never treated. I'm also a conservationist and I'm currently watching over a large population of wild honeybees living within the forests in the area that I keep bees. So I've adapted my beekeeping to suit the situation that I'm in. And as you can see, my hives, quite conventional hives, I still make splits, I still crop honey, 
However, I use ventilation slightly differently. I close most of it off and allow the bees to open and close uh, the vents as they see fit. I use multiple entrances. Um, and I also do not feed my colonies or support swarms. And the reason for that is, is in copying the natural situation that I have around me, those evolutionary dead ends where colonies are able to uh, fail at their own accord, it happens. That's not to say I ignore anything. As a beekeeper, I shepherd the situation. And if I was to see a problem, I react. So over my time being a non-treatment beekeeper, I've noticed that we have the persistent free-living colonies. I've seen a lack of deformed wing virus. I've seen brood removal. I've seen uncapping, recapping. Few mites. I was expecting from the horror stories that everyone tells you to see these explosive mite bombs, as they're called, and to see uh, a very horror show kind of esque situation, but it didn't occur. And I believe the wild population may have helped in that. My colonies have responsiveness to our local environment and conditions. And my losses have been confined to winter. I don't see anything out of the ordinary. I never have done during the middle part of the year. It's been relatively no drama. So the persistent free living colonies, as both Rona and Clive have mentioned, if you have a colony persisting and continuing to live beyond three years, you've got a gold mine on your, on your, uh, on your doorstep there and well worth collecting those colonies. You can look in the larger environment and if you notice these colonies surviving, not only are they a great source of bees for you, but it gives you an idea of what's happening and whether those genetics are available in your location. Hard to show a lack of deformed wing virus and, other than showing you a picture of nice healthy bees. But as my colonies have been dealing with um, varroa and keeping the mite numbers down, they also remove unhealthy bees um, and get rid of it and keep it out of the colonies. And generally, you will very rarely ever see a bee with deformed wing virus. They're all healthy and look nice. Brood removal. I spent a lot of time checking for hygienic behaviours on the bottom board. If you're going to go in and look for mite counts, you might as well check for the other stuff as well. And at the bottom, you would see these small things, which is the button for the laser. There we go. These little things here, and here, and here. And Ron Hoskins named them hockey sticks, I believe. Um, but they're basically the antenna, where their cells have been uncapped and pupae has been dragged out. They're the antenna, the first bits, and they fall through your mesh floors and land on the bottom, along with the other body parts. Uncapping behavior which leads to the hockey sticks and body parts falling out. You can see here a slightly later stage than Rona's picture. And the purple eyes on the bees there. And you can see, I think this one's been chewed out down the bottom there. And I've seen that from the start. It wasn't as if something just developed. These behaviors were there in the colonies. And you obviously want to work for those colonies. And if you see that behavior, it's something to, to encourage. Recapping behaviour. Now this was something that didn't, I didn't get a comment to until the last couple of years with Stephen's work. And it was something I'd kind of been aware of in a roundabout way. Because I was seeing this happen in colonies where I was requeening or uh, making nukes and you're waiting for them to mate and get going. And I was, seeing, I was seeing that happen and then I'd come back a few days later and it's, it's all gone and disappeared. So although I wasn't aware of the recapping ability, you would see that the uncapped cells have quickly vanished again. Um, and here generally you can, it's a frame, you can see small sections of uh, recapped cells um, and you will find them around areas where they have uncapped cells. So if you see the uncapped cells, you may see evidence of recapped cells around those if you have a keen eye. A few mites is another one that's hard to show unless you get zoomed right in on a, on a bottom board. But here's a colony that came from an untreated colony and was several years untreated itself. And you can see they built a bit of drone comb up in between the queen excluder. And you rip it off and you accidentally break the combs and you can see that there's no mites in there and very low drops on the floor. This responsiveness to my local conditions I don't often go into my colonies during October. I usually finish off during September. But this was a colony I'd gone to collect as part of the conservation project. A tree had gone over 
and they were in absolutely perfect condition. You can see they're all very healthy bees. If you can spot a bee with deformed wing virus in there, I'll give you a tenner. Um, and you can see the nest is completely shut down. There's no eggs, there's no brood, there's full of pollen, full of stores, very healthy, completely ready set. They were, they were adapt to their conditions. They're managing the varroa in line with their conditions and our flows as such. So I kept winter loss records and you can see that uh, my losses, my colony numbers don't become pretty significant until the fourth winter. So if we kind of ignore those first losses there, but as I built up with swarms for my local area, I experienced slightly higher than average uh, regional losses. So for the 2014-15, 2015-16 winters where I built up in numbers, you can see that my losses were plus 17 and plus 13 and a half percent above the regional uh, average. However, beyond that, as I started to work with my own colonies, we can see that um, my losses, the difference, then dropped to only, well, just below, just above, quite below, quite below, a lot below, just below. In the past several years, I've averaged, I think, around about 5% less than the regional average in winter losses, which is something similar to what Clive has experienced. If you look at it in a graph, which is a bit easier to understand, rather than looking at a table of numbers, my colony is the blue line, the regional average is the orange line, and you can see fourth winter when I've collected loads of swarms, and the fifth winter when I've collected loads of swarms, there's my high loss, and then I'm back down matching or better than the average. And this winter, I've lost one colony out of 22, which is, I think, 4.5% loss. That's my lab with some honey. <laughs> Thank you for listening. Thank you, Joe. Uh, good afternoon. Um, we are... Uh, are uh, based down in the southeast of England, uh, and we don't have the benefit of that many feral colonies uh, in our regions, a few we keep an eye on. And uh, so we do need to look for resistant traits in the area, and uh, I'm going to uh, talk you through how we do that. So we tend to see three bees in three camps. One. Uh, Roa naive, which not many of them these days after 30 years of Roa. Uh, the biggest group is Roa susceptible bees, and our job there is to try and recognize those and weed them out. And then the resistant bees, which we look for. So we, we class them as bees which are capable of managing their own Roa loads and roughly having the same Roa load at the end of the year as they have at the start of the year. So this is our framework, and I think it's a framework, we try to keep it simple so that all our bee, beekeepers can adopt this. So there are three things we look for. Firstly, uh, uncapping and recapping, which you've heard a lot about uh, this morning. Uh, the chewing out of infected uh, pupae. We think this is the key trait, and we see that uh, on, the, on the bottom board underneath an open mesh floor. Uh, and this happens before the reproduction of the varroa in the cell. Uh, and so you get this interruption uh, going on, and that should give you low mite counts. Okay, so one leads to the other, and low mite counts gives you low levels of deformed wing virus. So how do we read a frame? So this is uh, uh, one uh, where we've taken a picture, having shaken off the bees, and then had a look at it and blown it up back in the, the sanctity of the kitchen uh, rather than bees all around. It's quite hard to do. So I was going to pick out a few things. So the uncapped cells are very easy to see. We've talked a lot about those this morning. They tend to be about day 16 or 17 since they've been laid. Um, and the queen will lay in age groups. So if you look around, as Joe just said, you'll see lots of other recap cells up there. Can you see those? Right, I mean, and actually, when you see the brood frame, it's really, it's, it's very obvious. 
Uh, and the other thing, just in the, green, in the green boundary here, these are recently capped lava. And you can see, I hope, the cells there are a lot smoother and more convex. Again, it doesn't convey that well in, on a screen, but you can see the difference? Yeah. Okay. So we count mites, all right? So a lot of people don't, but uh, we uh, use an insert board. I'm lucky to have a garden apiary, so it's a good excuse to get out of the house. Uh, and uh, I do it every few days, right? and then clean the board and go again. Uh, and I have a colleague who puts her boards in for three days a month, and that gives her a pretty good guide. The, the real um, research win for us is, has been the, the seeing out, seeing of all the chewed out exoskeleton, and with the help of Stephen, understanding it, of what's gone on. So, um, uh, and that, so the, the insert board actually has become like a, a research uh, uh, lab for us, and in, been incredibly useful. So I'm going to run you through a couple of case studies. Um, first one is a full year analysis, and this is, uh, this is the setup. It's a national brew box, uh, and uh, nothing special about it. And this is, this is the full year analysis. It is in the case studies that we've published this morning with more interpretation. So, uh, so do go and have a look at that. So it shows the yellow line is daily mite drop through the whole year. Uh, the, the green is uh, where we can see brood uh, through, uh, through the course of the year during inspections. And then the P and the UN, I'll talk about in a minute, will just break that out for you, which is the signs of hygienic behaviour. I'm just going to restrict myself to three points on this. So, firstly, you need to do interpretation from the mic board over a period of time. Don't go in once a year in the summer and think you've understood it. Uh, secondly, um, brood break. So this is a, there was an artificial swarm there, um, and whenever there's an artificial swarm, the, there's going to be a broodless period, uh, which is healthy for all, for the whole colony against all brood diseases. Um, but also, you see a mite drop, you see a spike there, which in this case was 170. So the varroa have to go onto the bees; they've come out of the cells. And so you actually get rid of some of your mites there. But they're not the answer. Brood breaks are not the answer, because we've always had brood breaks. We haven't always had resistance, but they're helpful. And uh, the other one I'll just spend some time on is the spike here. So all of our colonies see this. It's sort of end of, end of summer, and it's triggered by a reduction in laying from the queen, less cells around, and sometimes multiple invasion by the same mites into each cell which doesn't end well for them. Um, but the other factor there is pre-hygienic winter behavior, which we tend to see as beekeepers with all the propolis build up different parts of the year. Uh, or sorry, that, that stage of the year. Uh, but we see a big clean out of mites. So that's, that's over 600 mites were dropped in this spike here. So they're akin to um, a treatment, if you like, and that's all done by the bees. This is just breaking out the hygiene behavior. So the P is the pupa on the, on the floor, uh, and the UN is the uncapping that we, that we see. So, so the really good news is at the start of the year, when the overwintered varroa uh, are looking to get back into the brood, and the, the first part of the brood, the bees are chewing them out and stopping them from reproducing. So instead of getting that big hockey stick build-up that you see in a lot of documents, you get the bees managing it right from the start of the year, and that's really cheering. Um, the other cheering thing is that you've got away from your family from all the Christmas festivities for a little while, <laughs> but you also know that your queen was laying 16 to 17 days previously. Good news. Um, the other thing I'll just point out is uh, during the the strongest part of our flow. So we get a lot of blackberry, Himalaya balsam, clover coming through here. Uh, we don't see so much hygienic behavior. So we've had to try and figure that out. And, and what we believe is that the colony uh, prioritizes winter stores over hygienic behavior at that point in time. And so the, the, the colony becomes a honey factory uh, and, uh, and so we don't see this, which is interesting. But that's a time when a lot of beekeepers get told that they should be checking for mites, right? 
And, and what's happening is that the bees, the mites, the underlying mite growth is, is, is quite high there, but it's in the cells and you won't see it, whether you do a mite sample or you're looking on the board. Um, so that's, uh, that's, that's quite interesting. And, and the last point I'll make on this is uh, the heritability of the hygienic behaviour. So we see this being passed down from queen to daughter to daughter to daughters. And um, so if you look here, the new queen starts laying after the artificial uh, swarm has taken place. And her nurse bees don't take over the colony until around this time here. But you can see the level of hygienic behaviour has continued in exactly the same way that it was for her mother. So a good, uh, good trait for the beekeeper. This is a second case study which is going to illustrate uh, levels of uncapping and recapping in the colony. This is from last May. So there's a picture of some brood frame. You've seen this quite a few times already this morning with lots of uh, uncapping on it. We're going to give that, uh, those cells a bit of green around them. And now we're going to zoom in uh, on the, the yellow rectangular area. Hopefully you can see that an awful lot of recapping has taken place. So, so your camera and blowing up pictures is your friend here. It's a really useful tool. So a lot of recapping taken place. Um, and then we did one other thing with, a, help, with a, a heavy heart, but just for research. We took the same picture of the same brood 24 hours later. Can you see the differences? We've marked them on, right? So, so in that 24 hours, all the green ones have been uncapped. <coughs> we could only find one that's being recapped here. Hopefully you can see that. But look at the chewing out that's happened. And some of these are from cells which were, already, which were sealed the previous day. So they've gone in there, they've not liked what they've found, and they've chewed it out. And we'll see that on the bottom board. All right? So you get to understand what's going on inside the colony, in the darkness, and you'll see it on your bottom board. You'll see the chewed out bits of exoskeleton. And this is the total amount of activity over those 48 hours. So a huge amount going on. I mean, who knew? We just did, we had no appreciation of this. And so this is, um, this is a level of activity which really ties back to some of Stephen's work where he's talked about... Uh, the recapping rates in resistant colonies in the UK and around the world being over 50%, 50 to 70%. So you can see that level of activity here. Right, how do we spread the best of our genetics around? Uh, firstly, by a lot of monitoring. Okay? So we've done quite a bit of work uh, in this area, and this shows the cumulative mite drops are not so daily added up through the uh, uh, late winter and spring of 2019. And... Uh, quite obviously, there is a colony which we have a problem with, and you find that through monitoring. So hive eight is a sinner, all right? And in our old regime, as most of us still probably do, we would have kept that colony alive. The drones would have been out there. We probably would have done an increase from it, right? So we've been perpetuating the problem because we haven't been able to recognize it. We, we provide extra drone comb uh, for our best colonies. So you can make a difference locally. So there's over 3,000 drones going to hatch from there. This, is, this schematic shows us moving uh, queens and nukes uh, around the area, just, uh, just sharing our best practice, trying to fill in the gaps, if you like. Uh, we, we have a, a hive record card which asks those questions about uncapping, about mite levels, and about hygiene behaviours. Would you breed from this queen? And that's, uh, that's on our website, on the Westroom website, so do help yourselves if that interests you. And then just getting started. So, as others have said, be cautious to start with. And there's a huge amount of rower susceptible bees out there. I mean, we, we haven't been selecting for row resistance for 30 years. So there's a lot of bees which can't make it. So we actually used a couple of biotechnical methods we learned from Dr. Ralph Buchler, uh, which you can find uh, on our website, but also on the National Honey Show uh, YouTube. Um, we look for those traits. So it's simple, uncapping and recapping, and chewing out equals low mites and low deformed wing virus. We work as a group. We set up a WhatsApp group, uh, and uh, we committed 
to sharing our successes and losses. So if things didn't work out, you know, and, and you know, this is beekeeping, it doesn't always work out, does it? And uh, uh, we, we help out with nukes and queens. So, so gradually, the best of the traits are going within our area. Uh, we only use our own queens, right? Um, and uh, uh, otherwise, you're going to disturb all of those genetics. So you can take back control over this just by doing your own monitoring. And I, I mean, I don't have, I don't accept any swarms at all uh, in, in my apiary. So we're completely self-sufficient. Um, and in the past, I think it's been fair to say that people who haven't treated have been the pariahs in an awful lot of beekeeping clubs. And, and actually, they're now the new rock stars. And, and, and when we present, we often find there's one, you know, and everyone goes to talk to them afterwards and, uh, and do, you know, make best friends with these people um, because they could be a superb source of bees for you. Uh, or try bait hiving uh, on feral colonies, as some of my colleagues uh, have mentioned. Uh, and I think with that, we're going to pass back to the chair, which is Stephen, and, and start some questions. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. I'd just like to thank um, my rock stars. It's been very difficult working with the rock stars, as it's not a rock star myself. And I do love Clive's group of resistant beekeepers, which should be 100 long. So what we want is, you know, we've got the advice, join, make us, you know, make this very long. Okay, so questions are opening. I'll flick back to the website so you can write down um, the number there. We'll go on the end of it. Uh, thank you very much, especially to the last speaker for talking about a sort of a suburban area. So um, I also keep bees in an urban or suburban area near Manchester. One of the things that was bothering me about this whole idea of trying to go treatment free was the question of drones from other non uh, of treatment bee beekeepers, people, and also the question of drifting of varroa mites from other colonies into mine. Um, what can you tell me to reassure me that I'd be okay if I went down your route? Yeah. I mean, firstly, be secure in what you know you have. I think that's the important thing. And secondly, start knocking on doors and going to see people. Uh, so we've done that in our area. We know everyone just about, and have either signed them up to our club uh, or offered them the occasional free queen, um, and, uh, um, and, it's, and, and try it. You know, I mean, it's, you won't know until you try, and it's, it's a funny thing. When, um, I mean, not everyone is right for this, okay? So people, some people are so cautious that they don't want to try it, but once you start monitoring, you start seeing the difference in your own colonies. Uh, and getting those drones out, you will make a difference around your area. Um, uh, you, can you be cut off from everyone else? It doesn't sound like you can be. So you'll just have to suck it and see, I'm afraid. I don't think there's more you can do with that. But working as a group uh, is the best way forward, if that's possible in any way. Hi, thanks a lot. I really enjoyed that presentation. It's great to see beekeepers working in communities to try to tackle some of these problems because that's going to make it much more likely to succeed. My question is around the capping, recapping trait and the pupil removal trait. Talked a lot about seeing it in workers. Do you see it in drones and do you measure it in drones? Okay, so a uh, good question, Gile. Uh, no, we've measured it in just two populations, so the data sets are quite small in South Africa in Cuba. Um, they do recap in some colonies, but it's not targeted at all. It seems to be random. Um, why they do it, we don't know. The ones in South Africa were survivor colonies from an AFB trial, and they just recapped random uh, drone brood. We didn't see in other ones. Other people have seen it. Uh, it does occur, but it just seems to be untargeted um, capping. And it just brings you on to a quick point there, is you go, duh, why are they, they're not recapping, uncapping the drone brood? Because there's loads of mites in there. But what we think's happening, and, and this is yet to, well, it's sort of semi-proven, but we really need people to work on it, 
is what's happening is they're forcing the, uh, the mites not to go in the drone brood. We've got good evidence from um, long-term populations in, in places like Brazil. And what they're doing is as soon as there's some drone brood, they flood it, absolutely flood it. And I've seen this in Mexico 20 years ago. Um, but there is multiple mites in every cell. And it explains why when we measured the mite populations in these colonies, they drop only when there's drone brood. So they climb when there's worker brood very slowly, and then they drop when the drone brood's there. So we think they're drone culling. They're drone trapping as well. And that's maybe why they're not doing it. So they're using another method for that. Um, thank you. I just wanted to ask about um, seeing recapping from the outside, because previously we were told that the only way you could tell that a cell had been recapped was by taking the lid off and looking for the, the absence of the silk cocoon. Is that, is that now changed? And how, what do we look for, please? Um, so, you can. What they're saying is correct. You, you can see it with an ex exper ex experienced eye. We have been fooled. And being scientists, we will then check, obviously. Um, but if you get the right, if you get it recent, then the wax is still a very different colour. And yes, you can see, I can look at a frame now and go, OK, th this is the area we're going to target. And so they are correct. Um, if you do look very carefully, but often... Without that, ex you've got to build that experience and talk to people who have done this and seen this, and then they can point things out for you. So, so is it a case of us um, looking at cells that we think might be recapped, opening them up, and then confirming it by? Or? Perfect. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Could I, um, could I just <laughs> interrupt and say that if you wanted to discover it, just as Steve had done taking photos of comb, you can do exactly the same yourself. Take pictures. Go back in 24, 48 hours later. Similarly to what I was experiencing where I'd go in a couple of days later to check on Queens and you'd see that it's been covered over and you can do that method methodologic well, I can't say the word. Methodology. <laughs> the, the, the other, can I just add something there? I mean, we've, um, Stephen has taken us down the path of uh, uncapping and recap or recapping being a proxy for a row resistant. We've sort of gone slightly further, if you like, because... Um, what actually stops the Roa reproduction taking place is the chewing out process, right? And that happens before the Roa reproduce. So the Roa reproduce within a worker cell around about day 10, and the pink to purple eye stage is six, seven, eight. So the key for us, the key evidence that we like to see is not just uncapping, recapping, actually is the white exoskeleton on the board underneath that so we know that interruption is taking place. So we do have colonies where we see uncapping, but the mite levels are slightly too high. So there's not sufficient enough hygienic behavior going on there. Thank you. Hello, everyone. I apologize for my English. I'm not the native speaker, English speaker. Um, my background is Polish. Uh, may I enjoy your club? Why I'm asking because I keep bees in England uh, since 2011, and I think 2010. In 2012, I stopped treating, and I done about well, I was selling bees as well, but about 200 colonies in uh, eight apiaries without treatments at all, zero. Okay, so I acquired bees from the wild swamps. Um, and I treated, uh, just treated, treated as a break um, um, the brood cycle. So, splitting colonies and um, caging queens in the period you, of the time you, you said. So, it worked for me very well. I know in Cambridge, Cambridgeshire, we've got about, I know about, I discovered about 50 wild colonies. I'm going uh, around every spring um, when it's good weather, February or March, uh, I'm watching if they're flying, if they survive. Uh, of course, it's difficult to check if they're bringing pollen because they could be robbed from another colonies. But if I can, I just go and check they're bringing pollen. 
So they surviving. We've got probably very huge mass of the good genetic around, which uh, produce good drones. About the drones capping and uncapping, I've got uh, colonies with very nice pattern of the workers' brood, but the drones are really patchy. It means the bees, uh, the devourer goes to the drones uh, brood, and the bees taking the, the pupa, pupa out, uh, basically, clean the, the hygiene with the, the drones. So, you know, I'm, I'm happy to he, be here and I am happy to see you, everyone, because uh, when I start doing this in, in um, a few years, uh, 2012, 2013, 2014, people look at me, local beekeeper association, no, you need to treat bees. You need to do this all things. You cannot, bees cannot live widely. They cannot live in a chimney. There are swarms coming from our hives going to to, to trees and they, they cannot uh, cope with varroa. But now what I know about, I think 10, 15, 20 percentage of the all bees are uh, resistant to varroa. Not just Carnolia, not the black bees, not the Italian, all of them, but have good genetic. And I think with um, uh, the good support, all of us, to, to, to spread the good genetic as well. But stop treating. Sorry to say that. My, I'm from Poland. My, my family kept the bees for three generations. We have a beekeeping farm there. There's quite a big operation. My brother keeps 2,000 beehives. And my background is commercial beekeeping, right? So we always treated bees. But then how to find the bees who are good? Okay, to do the test, to, to, to look at the, the, the debris, everything. But I think the best solution is stop treating. Because if you stop treat, let's just rid of that bad uh, genetic and keep going, good genetic, just, uh, just growing. And uh, that's what I would like to, to share with you. This is possible. Uh, well, one thing I, I'm actually dealing with uh, recently, which is not very good, is the EFB, I'm afraid, we've got in Cambridgeshire. And the bee unit just came and just stopped a few of my apiaries because they found EFB single cells uh, in a few apiaries. And pff, it's actually killing me. <laughs> and then, um, but you know, last, last 10 years, we've got a lot of bees, okay? And it's possible. Thank you for your hard work, and thank you for sharing everything today with us. And then I, if I can after just come and share contacts with you, it would be fantastic. Thank you very much. Hi, uh, I would, uh, Stephen, I would have, wasn't really sad, I was going to ask the question about drone brood, the fact that it isn't uncapped, and I don't really feel it's properly explained yet, but I would like just to uh, share one experience with you, that we have done extensive investigation of drone brood, particularly in um, feral nests, and Yes, there are mites in them, but they haven't bred. You, you can find mites in a high proportion of cells, but we were, in one case, we were not able to find a single offspring from these parent mites. And I presume this is an infertility phenomenon. Yep. Yeah, so there's this increased infertility, so they're not breeding, or they might produce a male. But yes, that's correct. Mm. It's a bit like being at an AA conference, this. So, my name's Steve, and I don't treat. <laughs> <laughs> and what's nice is being able to actually come out the cupboard, because you do, when you talk to people, you do get uh, sort of strange looks at the best, and uh, bricked, and uh, tarred and feathered uh, at the worst. But I think, for me, the biggest hurdle that anybody's got in this is actually the drug companies, the people who actually manufacture this. And I bet if I go in to the trade centre there, I'll be told that if I don't treat, within three months my bees will be dead. And any beginners that are coming through now, listening to that, will automatically start doing it. And I think there's got to be a lot more education, if this is supported by the BBKs, to actually get the information, the true information out there as to, as to what is going on. Yeah, um, the BBK are behind us, they do fund this, uh, they do support it, um, they have to be careful, um, of course the B unit will be the last to fall in line, um, but we're pushing at an open door and 
what we need is we predict there's about 2,000 of you hidden rock stars among the, the beekeepers, and we've got two. I don't know if there's anybody else wants to uh, come clean today in the audience <laughs> and join us. Um, but we would like the people that, that haven't treated for over sort of five, six years um, to contact us and get, tell their personal stories and we'll put it on the website along with uh, all the other ones that we have and we'd like to grow that. The way this website is just starting. Um, it's not perfect and the idea is, is to continue to develop it um, as the beekeepers want. We've got um, these people actually monitor the Facebook and groups, God knows how much time they've got to do this, but they, they follow, uh, follow these big groups so we can take the advice, the best advice, and you know, as things get updated and we'll update the website. And we hope this is a step in the right direction. Um, it will be slow, um, unfortunately, but there are a lot of people out there that are willing, and just by the number of people are in, in this hall, they're not you know, there to see my beautiful face, they're here to listen about um, rural resistance, and you may be interested in it. <coughs> so thanks very much. for people to indicate uh, if they would. Just wonder if people would, is it working? Yep. yep. Mind just uh, indicating if you're a non, if you're finding that you can keep bees? Anyone want to show hands? There we go. It's more, more than you might think. Ooh. Thank you. Excellent. Uh, any more questions? I know we've run over, but we always have, we've got a little bit of time, because unless if you want, we won't hold you for much longer. Can you, do you have any tips to uh, catch a, colony, a wild colony that's in a tree? It's about to swarm now, I guess. Any tips uh, oh, just to catch them? all the beekeepers, Martin. <laughs> Use bait boxes high up. One inch round holes. Um, I often will only use probably about a double five frame nuke is the best if you've got nuke, nuke boxes. A double five frame nuke. Around that volume, I'll lose the, leave the bottom box empty. Don't, don't frame uh, frames in the top, yeah. they've got something to get going on. And if you've forgotten where you put your box, they've got a bit of area to go crazy in as well and have a disco. Old, old yep, a couple of old frames. You can use uh, lemongrass oil. People sell swarm laws. Um, but give it, give it good height yeah. and be safe when you're doing it. Try not to fall out of a tree. <laughs> Okay, Thank thanks very much. <laughs>